right, I'm just going to I'm just going to kind of read through it because if I uh if I tried to just look at notes and freestyle, I'm going to be all over the place. Like I said, I don't do this, so I'm very nervous and uh this week went by like a blink of an eye. When they first asked me about uh sharing my testimony, it was I think a couple months ago. I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. It seemed like it would be, you know, like years from now. All of a sudden, I went to sleep last Sunday and woke up, and it was today. And uh, I don't remember this whole week, but uh, I was definitely nervous. So uh, starting out, uh, here's a little bit about uh, my testimony and my life here. Uh, Proverbs 16:25. <clears throat> There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I was born and raised in the city of Chino. I was raised by my grandparents, who did the best they could. Though they had a lot on their plate raising several family members, my mom lived there also, but she was young and doing her own thing, so my grandparents was pretty much uh, everything to me. I have a memory that played a major role in my life back when I was a kid. It was June 26, 1981. I ran into the living room because I heard my mom and whoever else was uh, there screaming that they just killed my dad up the street. They all, <clears throat> they all jumped in the car and fled to the scene. I was left behind in the living room. I'm not sure of the emotions and the thoughts that went through my mind. I don't even know if I processed it, what I just heard, but I do know that I never saw my dad after that day. My dad was a Chino Center gang member, and his death was gang-related. I don't really have any memories of my dad. I don't know if it was due to all the alcohol, drug abuse, and craziness of my life that I erased uh, my past. I, I just don't remember much, and the things that I do, I'm not really sure if I made them up. You know, like I said, my grandparents did the best they could. They were always there for me, so I'd take nothing away from them. They've always loved me and, and uh, did everything for me. But as a young uh, boy, it just wasn't enough. Growing up on 11th Street seemed to be a nor normal upbringing. Now looking back, I realize it was not. My neighbors and surrounding neighbors all around me were all Chino Center gang members. I grew up playing in, in the front, kind of like what Pastor was talking about earlier. You know, when the street lights uh, were off, it's go time. We're in the middle of the street playing over the line, playing uh, football, all that stuff. And these guys used to, uh, these guys used to be out there and, and uh, they'd play with us too. You know, they'd go out there and, and join us. If the game was getting good, you know, the uh, cars would be trying to get through and they would send them around. You know, get out of here, you know. So... You know, you start admiring that as a kid. You know, you don't have any anyone to look up to. That as far as uh, as far as that as me, that's what I did. I started looking up to these guys. They were pretty cool guys, tough guys. My best friend Sam lived on the other side of the main hangout between my house and his house. When I was at his house, we used to witness a lot of stuff. We'd witness major fights, beatings, stabbings, drug overdoses. Uh, these are times when there was certain cops that used to pull up. And I don't blame them, you know, they, you know, on the streets, you put them through a lot. So I understand that now. But there were certain cops that would pull up and call somebody out, go toe-to-toe, -to -toe and then get in the car and leave. They wouldn't even take them to jail. They just want to get down because, you know, they're probably stressed out from everything the guys did to them. The older homies, which, uh, which were probably about 18 years old, these were just kids, you know, that we looked up to. And, uh, but we considered them the older homies. They used to talk to us and let us know all about hanging out in the hood, that it was all good, jail, all that stuff. None of it was no big deal. One of the homies even told me, hey, Butch, don't worry about nothing. They make pancakes in there just like Nana does, my grandma. I was like, wow, maybe it ain't too bad in there. Uh, Matthew 15, 14. There are blind guides leading the blind, and if one blind person guides another, they'll both fall into a ditch. Just a few years after my dad was killed, I had my first encounter with the cops. Me and my buddies decided to climb into a second-story building in the old school part of Chino on D Street. It was a sporting good place uh, where we uh, broke into and pretty much just ran around. And on our way out, we grabbed a couple jackets. We were heading back to Sam's house when, uh, 
we got to his front yard and we heard that sound that anybody that's ever ran from the cops heard, uh, has, has heard before and you hate that noise of that engine revving re your way. So here they come, they got us. We had the jackets in our hands, they cuffed us up, getting ready to take us down to the station when my buddy's mom came outside at the last minute. She walked straight up to my buddy and slapped him square in the face. We were 10 years old. This was the beginning of a hard lesson, the beginning of something that would never end for quite some time, would not end for quite some time. Just a few, few years after that, I was arrested again and sent to juvenile hall this time. I was 12 years old and in and out from there. I spent my 18th birthday in juvenile hall. About, about a month after my 18th birthday, I was informed I was too old to be in there and I'd have to complete the remainder of my time in the county jail. After my time was complete, I was re released and back on the streets for one month before I picked up my first prison term. This was in the early 90s, the peak of gang activity, street terrorism, as the court called it. This is where things started to move really fast in my life. I grew up knowing this is where I could earn my stripes, earn my name in jail. And for some weird reason, I don't, I don't you know, the, the enemy has us so blind thinking that, uh, we have to impress people in the neighborhoods and, and do some opposite stuff. It's just straight darkness. But this is where I knew I could earn my name, earn my stripes. Uh, I used to participate in every assault, every fight, every riot, everything that came my way, trying to get that respect. The next 10 years, I was in and out of prison. After being released from my first term is where I immediately, immediately met my girlfriend, who is my wife now. We had a short relationship when she became pregnant. Right after she was about to give birth, I picked up my second term. Right when she was about to give birth, I picked up my second term. I was sentenced to three years with 80%. When I got out, my daughter was already three years old. I was still lost, running amok. I wasn't with my girlfriend at this point and on a downward spiral. I picked up a parole violation at the completion of this violation, I was met in R&R by the San Bernardino County Sheriffs, advising me that I'm being released to their custody. I was informed I had a pending charge that was making me eligible for the three-strike law, which was an automatic life sentence. <laughs> Thanks to the grace of God, I was able to get a plea deal Evidence was too weak, and I was made an offer I couldn't refuse. I had to sign the deal, and I began my third term. After I got out, after I got out of this mess, I was on parole, and I paroled to a bad part of San Bernardino, where I picked up right where I left off. I was back on drugs, getting arrested. I was a lost cause. A couple days after New Year's, my PO called me in for a random drug test. And at, at this point in my life, it was routine going in and out of prison. My wife took me to the PO's office to, to drop me off to go do my violation. I remember going in the house and telling, hey, the PO called, I, I gotta go in, so I'll see you in six months or to a year, whatever it is, whatever they decide. So put my tannies away and put on my shower shoes, get ready to roll. It was that routine. It's so sad that you can be this lost. To, that going to prison becomes that, that norm. I walked into Miss Adams. My pro officer was named Miss Adams. Uh, I walked into Miss Adams' office, and she asked me if I was ready to test. I told her I hadn't slept in days and don't even bother with the test. I told her I was still high at that point. And uh, she took me back to her office. She sat me down. She just looked me straight in the face in disbelief and uh, whatever other looks she was giving me. But... She said, don't you want to live? Don't you want to raise your children? She said, don't you want a life? All this hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt shame. I felt embarrassment. I told her, of course, it's just not working out for me. This lady had to have known the Lord because she did not violate me. She didn't return me to custody. She told me she believed I could change. She believed I had a I needed a chance. She committed me to a 30-day program at the Star Center, at the Star Program, which consisted of drug and alcohol classes for 30 days. 
I had I had to be at the pro office for eight hours a day, and uh, I accepted that. So I, I I went home and I told my wife what happened, and I think that little bit of hope in Miss Adams uh, it lit a fire in me. That little hope that she's seen that I'd never experienced someone telling me, "Hey man, I think you just need a chance." Uh, it lit that it lit that fire in me, and uh, after that. I didn't mess with drugs, and I haven't been back to prison in over 20 years. <laughs> After this program, I started working near that area. We were able to save up money, move back to Chino. And shortly after, she discharged me. I'd been drug and prison free for 20 years at that point. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you says the Lord. There are plans of good and not disaster to give you a future and a hope. That's NLT version. With all that being said, I should have been dead. There were several occasions, whether it had to go, whether it had to do with drugs, alcohol, or violence, that I should have lost my life. Even as far as having to receive CPR to revive me. <clears throat> Looking back now, I realized the Lord always had a plan for me. I see the lessons which I continue learning, even after drugs, prison, and gangs. Getting past, getting past that, you think you're all in the clear. Prison, gangs, I mean, all that was done, I was good. I truly believed I was now living an all-American life, working, providing for my family, enjoying my Budweiser's on every occasion. You could, on every occasion you could think of rain, shine, day, night, weekends, Weekdays, funerals, weddings, <laughs> you get the picture. I was a functional drunk because no matter what, I would get up and go to work. It was normal to me. I don't see anything wrong with it. I didn't see anything wrong with it. I always thought it was okay since I handled my business, paid my bills, my mortgage, my kids had everything they needed. We were never in need of anything, but we were still without the Lord in our home. I first came to Calvary Chapel, I believe, in 2005. From that time till 2023, I was a lukewarm Christian. The Word of God says in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I know all things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. That's so scary to me. That whole time I was pretty much taking up space here in these pews, counting the minutes till service would end so I could get back to my beers. Many times I've sat in these pews listening to speakers, testimonies like I'm giving now, Pastor David give the message. I always thought he was talking about somebody else because I handled my business. I'm a hard worker, I make a good living with my hands and my back, but the Lord doesn't need hard workers, he needs obedient and he wants a re relationship with us. A lot of times those messages were just for me, and I just brushed them off, thinking they were for the guy next to me down the road. We were starting to experience conviction. One day one of the services was about marriage, and it hit my wife that we were living in Sid. We were, we were together for 11 years at that point with our kids, and we, weren't, we were still living in Sid, we were not married. My wife told me, kind of like Stroker, get on the plane, we're heading to Vegas to get married. It was a Monday. That was our first step of obedience. And it was the Lord that told us what to do. Throughout the next several years, from around 2014, we became a lot more stable and consistent coming to service. We also began hitting a Wednesday night here and there. You know, at that time, I had no idea the Lord, the Lord was working in me, molding me, shaping me, doing the things to make the man that's here today. Still under construction, but now under the Lord's construction, not under the enemy's destruction. Far from where I was and far from what I deserve, I started hearing Pastor David give the messages about how to be a man, how to be a husband. The one that always hits me the most is how to be a father. All the, it was all the things I was never taught growing up. 
as a man. It was throughout all these years that we were learning these lessons. Lessons that I guess are natural to some, but not all. But the most important thing is that we realize that these lessons were being taught through our pastor from the Lord. So keep in mind, throughout all this process, it still wasn't right. I was still drinking. My wife was my drinking partner, so we always drank. We would still show up for service, dehydrated and hungover. So, we naturally, so naturally, the Lord began convicting my wife of drinking because she's perfect. And the Lord loves her more than me, according to her. <laughs> I just ignored it. She got sober. She got sober and said she wasn't going to be playing with her God anymore. She was going to serve him whether I did or not. I watched the Lord work in my wife's life. I saw it with my own eyes. I seen his I seen her prayers answered. I was amazed at how he spoke to her. I was amazed at how he spoke to her. But I couldn't let my beers go. I was attending Bible studies at this point, but even though I'd go to Bible study, I would take off as soon as it was done and hit the liquor store, the gas station, whatever on the way home to get a few in. Since she was no longer my drinking partner, I told her I was going to watch, I would tell her, I'm going to go watch a game or go watch a fight, go, go do something somewhere else so I could drink comfortably, not around her. I didn't want to make her stumble, but the only, I didn't want to make her stumble, but that only lasted for so long. Eventually, I was compromising her walk by asking her to come with me to the bar. I would tell her to drink her water while I had a few. I used to put it in my head that I, well, I have a designated driver, so, you know, it's all good. You know, it's not, nothing wrong with that. You know, how shameful is that? How shameful is that that I would ask her to, to join me there and I would put her walk with the Lord, her obedience uh, in jeopardy like that, knowing, you know, she was my drinking partner and she loved to drink too, but she was being obedient to God. I was putting it in her face just like that. That's one thing I'm so ashamed of. But I've been forgiven by both her and the Lord. One day sitting in my kitchen, just did my regular routine in the back. I was going to have dinner, run to the store, get a few beers before I go to bed for work. And out of nowhere, my wife walks up, and she hit me with it. She said, when are you going to stop playing games with my God? When are you going to get right? Without a doubt, in my mind, in my heart, I knew that was the day. I turned and looked at her, and I, I let her know today's the day. She walked away and went to the room, and I'm sure she was praying. And I prayed that day. I, I sat in my living room and I prayed and I cried out to the Lord. I told him, I'm done. I want to serve you. Since January 3rd, 2023, I've been completely sober and serving the Lord. You know, I wasn't too sure why I had to completely stop drinking. But I prayed to the Lord and said, please let my prayers get to the roof. Because my wife always reminded me that my prayers never pass the roof. <laughs> the, very, the, very next, uh, the very next day, I had a phone call from my cousin. I was still confused, like, okay, is you know, drinking that big a deal? All that stuff. I got a phone call from one of my cousins. He was drinking, he was buzzed, and like usual, he called me for advice. I don't know why he always called me, because I always gave him bad advice. I only grew, I grew up in the neighborhood. That's all I knew. I'd tell him, uh, he'd call me. It's always the same situation. I'd tell him, hey, you know, you better go handle your business. Don't let nobody disrespect you. If somebody's talking about you, go handle it right now because if you let it wait, you'll never have any respect. Handle that business. I know what he wanted to hear, but I told him, I know why you called, and I know what you expect to hear, but something changed yesterday. I accepted the Lord in my life, and I can only give you godly advice now. See, I knew all this because I had been coming here for years. Because Pastor David and through his teaching, I was, I was attending for all these years, and I didn't realize the Lord was working in me, and he was planning this in me. So I was learning without even knowing it. I was just lukewarm and sitting here. But thank the Lord that I kept coming back. I was one foot in, one foot out. 
but I was dumb. Pastor may not know this, but he's been my spiritual father since I first got here. We were on the phone for about two and a half hours, crying and laughing. We ended our phone call with, I love you and God bless. I prayed to the Lord and I said, I understand why I need to be sober all the time. You never know when somebody's in need, when that call is going to come. Since that day, my cousin is now saved and sober. You know, the Lord started working a lot at this time and it uh, just showing me, I didn't realize, you know, my, my 26 year old daughter, she was, she had been watching. She's a real sharp kid. She's, we got one out of three. So that, uh, <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to run with that. You know, <laughs> I deserved worse, <laughs> but uh, she, my 26, uh, 26 year old daughter, she confronted me shortly after I gave myself to the Lord. She confessed that she resented me and always considered me to be a hypocrite. We're always telling her, don't drink, don't go out and party, and don't do any of that stuff when I was constantly drinking while I was telling her. I would let her know this stuff, and I would just sit down on the couch, turn on the fight, open my beer, and all right, I'll see you later. Thought I did my job. I told her, don't do it. She said, but something's different about you. It was obvious it was the Lord working. You never know who's watching, so you've got to always represent the right way. Don't take the Lord lightly. You're a tool in his toolbox. He would call on you one day. Be ready for that call. A few days later, I sat down and I wrote a prayer in my Bible for my prodigal son. He was going through some rough, rough times and had not heard, we had not heard from him for over a year. We had filed a missing person on him. And one day, oh, me and my wife had a hard conversation that we had to come to the realization that we might receive a phone call that found his body. We actually had that conversation. So we prepared ourselves for that. The prayer I wrote in my Bible that day was for my son. I prayed to the Lord that I would serve him. I would give him myself if he would just bring our son, bring our son home. I, would, I know we shouldn't expect certain things from the Lord. We should just be obedient. But he says in 1 John 5.15, since we know he hears, hears us when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. So that's what I did. I immediately wanted to serve the Lord after that. I, just, I had a fire in me. I said, I just need to get busy. I wasted so much time. So he began using me from, from that day. He gave me a heart to serve. From the first, from the first phone call, from my cousin to speaking here today. I serve as an usher for se second service. I was given the opportunity to serve in, uh, with the Maui Disaster Relief Team. I began serving with the Children's Ministry for the Lion Tamers once a month. I was given the opportunity to pray with a couple guys during their final days who both gave themselves to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for that. One of them, one of the guys, he grew up on 11th Street also. We just buried him yesterday. Uh, I sat there and I talked to him and he knows me, you know, from the neighborhood. He'd never seen me as a Christian man, as a servant of the Lord. So I walked up and, and we just started talking. He had some oldies playing in the, uh, in the hospital room and it was crowded. All his family, I was intimidated and all these people know my background, know what I'm about. So they see me come in, but I was shocked immediately. One of his family members in the room just asked me without, uh, Without me saying anything, are you here to pray? And it, it blew my mind right there. I said, yeah, I'm here to pray. So I asked my buddy Lonzo that was in the bed. I said, hey, what's up, bro? We just started talking, and we told a few stories. And I said, hey, man, uh, so not everybody gets the opportunity that you have right now. You know, the opportunity to get right with the Lord, knowing you're on your way out in a couple days. You want to get right with the Lord and ask him to come into your life, forgive you for your sins? He said, yeah, let's pray. So we prayed. When we were done, he had a smirk on his face, and he was just shaking his head looking at me. He keeps saying, butchie, butchie. <laughs> and he lifted, his arm, he lifted his arm up, and he had this bracelet on there. It said, cling to Jesus. I was like, you're already a believer? He said, oh, someone came in the morning, some nurse, 
that he never met and just gave him that. But he told me, here, I want you to have it. I told him, nah, man, that's for you. And he said, hey, they gave it to me. I'll give it to who I want. So I took it, and I, I wear it, and I represent it in his honor. So that, uh, I attended uh, men's Bible study. I served behind the scenes. Not sure if I'm supposed to even mention that. But uh, I'm with the first responders ministry, which had to be the Lord's work considering my history. <laughs> right? Don't make no sense, right? <laughs> Through the first responders ministry and the love and encouragement from my brother Henry here, I'm in prayer for possibly joining the chaplaincy with the Chino Fire Department. I know this is all part of the Lord's plan. I'm going to finish up with my son, uh, what, what took place with my son. June 9th, which was my son's birthday last year. We had a movie night at my house. My in-laws were there. We decided to have pizza, watch a movie, and hang out. Everybody knew not to mention my son's name because it would make my wife burst into tears immediately. But the Lord had other plans. Before we started the movie, my daughter asked me if we could gather in a circle and pray. This blew my mind 100% out of the ordinary for my house. It, just, it was just a different, different world. I said, of course we can. We got in a circle. I prayed. I led in prayer. Then my wife said a prayer for our son, a beautiful prayer. Then we just sat down and in peace, and we turned the movie on and enjoyed our night. Two days later, my, phone, my wife's phone rang. It was our son. He said he was tired. He wanted to come home. This was six months of being obedient. And sober to our Lord. Six months since I wrote that prayer in my Bible. We immediately jumped in the truck and jumped uh, took off to pick him up. I always heard you don't deal with these types of situations like that. You have to deal with tough love. But we also knew this is the Lord working. So we did we acted out of love. Since then my son gave himself to the Lord. <sighs> Nobody better make fun of me when I say, the Lord. <laughs> Since then, my son gave himself to the Lord. His journey has just begun. He's got a lot of work ahead of him, but the Lord's working in him. He's under construction. He's another tool in the Lord's toolbox now. I just hope he's a faster learner than I am. All glory to God. So remember, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. So if any of you guys are playing games with my God today, get right today. Thank you.